So welcome to today's presentation on growing great tomatoes and peppers. We just went through our public service announcement about citrus greening disease, the black fig fly, and the med fly. And now we're back to our presentation, so welcome. So for today's talk, we're gonna do an overview of the family. And we're gonna go through the growing great peppers and tomatoes presentation um, in this with highlighting these topics, plant selection, planting and site selection, watering, mulching, fertilizing, pest management. I have some resources. I have questions at the end, but you're welcome to ask questions throughout the presentation as we go along. And every time we do an edible plant discussion, whether it's squash or tomatoes or broccoli or Brussels sprouts or whatever, we kind of break it down into these topics. And there's a reason that we do that. And it's because if you sort of look at this list here, if you break down each vegetable or fruit or really each plant that you wanna grow into these topics, it makes management, at least in my mind, it makes managing them easier because I sort of divide it up into these topics mentally. As I said in the beginning of the presentation, um, because bell peppers and tomatoes are so similar, this is like one and a half presentations. It's not quite two presentations and it's not quite one. Um, but so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through and just compare and contrast tomatoes and peppers and talk about their needs. So we'll be talking about both vegetables or fruits really at the same time. I hope that's not confusing. I originally had done it where I separated tomatoes out and then did peppers, but there were so many similarities that, um, and I thought the contrasts were interesting. So that's the way I've done it. Hope it's not confusing and um, feel free to ask questions as we go along or share in the chat um, your experience. If anybody is joining us from outside of the Inland Empire, like in the high desert, the mountains outside the county, you don't have to, but feel free to put your location or general area in the chat. And as I'm talking, I'll sort of keep in mind those areas. Otherwise, the sort of um, broad sweeping comments that I make are tar targeted towards San Bernardino County's Inland Empire area. Okay. Oh, and we got someone in the high desert or the east desert. So I'll be mindful of that when I share my observations. Oops. Okay. So an overview of the family. It's the nightshade or potato family, the Solanaceae family, Solanaceae, so that is the family. And you can see this picture on the right here. This is the ketchup and fries. Um, that is probably a proprietary name. I can't remember who first did it, but it's where they've grafted a potato plant to a tomato plant. You know, it wouldn't be very many fries. And I'm not sure how many ketchup, how much ketchup you would make out of it. But it's certainly a cool idea. And that is not Photoshop there. That is a legitimate plant on the right there. And uh, they have poisonous alkaloids in the leaf material. I have heard some cultures um, eating some of the leaf material. Um, in general, as master gardeners, you know, of course, we always tell you to do your own research and talk to your doctor before you put things in your mouth. Um, but uh, the alkaloid level in the different, the different plants in the nightshade family varies. You know, and there's also like the gypsum weed, which is really common in the Inland Empire here, has that beautiful kind of moon flower, um, flower that's also in the same family and that is deadly. And a lot of people have made tea and it's not gone well. So they have different levels of alkaloids in the leaf material. Um, and so in general, they could range from being very harmful to just causing an upset stomach, but their fruit um, and their roots or modified stems can be quite delicious. They're most abundant in uh, Latin America. As you think about in South and Cent South America, how many varieties of potatoes they have. Um, and within the family, there's annuals, perennials, biennials, and many that are considered weeds like the gypsum or weed or nightshade. Their commonly found varieties are tomatoes, potatoes, tobacco, uh, hot peppers, sweet peppers, and over 2,500 species overall. Um, same thing is true for the peppers. For plant selection, and there's a lot of similarities, so I'll go over it more in detail in the first slide and then I'll go to the pepper slide. Um, I'm gonna skip that first bullet point. Um, for tomatoes, you have determinant, determinant and indeterminate varieties. 
And um, that is also true for peppers as well. I was just double checking that slide because when I did more research, you don't commonly hear about determinant versus indeterminate peppers as often as you hear about it in tomatoes. I am going to go back to really what that means in depth in just a moment. But basically, um, when you're looking for varieties, now, when you buy plants at the nursery, at the garden center, the tag may not have that information. I was specifically looking for indeterminate tomatoes this year, and about half of the tags um, had information. A lot of the varieties were determinant, and a lot of the tags just didn't have anything. But we'll talk more about that in just a second. And basically for the qualities, you're gonna be looking for flavor, skin thickness, ripening time, disease resistance. For some of these things, you want full sun or heat tolerance, because even though tomatoes and peppers do like the sun, they can definitely overheat, or varieties that might tolerate some shade and people living in the high desert, um, I mean, not the high desert, in the mountains, um, you know, sometimes like varieties that don't need quite as much sun. If you, lived in a, if you live in a high wind area or an area like in the Inland Empire or desert that gets very hot, then um, looking for that heat tolerant variety might be good. The other thing you can also do is you can look for varieties that are a little bit smaller. Oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. I'm at the office. I thought we were going to be really good. Please let me know if I cut out. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and so if you think about big tomatoes, like the tomatoes on the left, um, they're going to take longer to ripen. And if you have really harsh conditions, or also if you have a heavy pest pressure, these tomatoes that are going to be smaller, um, they don't necessarily have to be cherry, but the smaller tomatoes will take usually less time to ripen. There's also uh, like early harvest varieties, they're called, or quick ripening varieties. Any place where you have high winds, really hot weather, or a lot of pest pressure, you might want to look for those early ripening, quick ripening varieties. And then for heirloom or open pollinated versus hybrid, that really only matters or comes into the conversation um, in two different or three different ways. One way is if you're gonna seed save, and we do a whole presentation on seed saving your tomato seeds and pepper seeds, tomato seeds you ferment, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, if you're not seed saving, it probably matters less to you. But there are two other reasons to consider open pollinated or heirloom or hybrid. And the other reason for an heirloom variety might be because you're looking and, um, you know, thinking about saving, um, you know, we have, if you think about how many plants are on the planet and how many of those plants are edible, and then you think about how many are commonly edible, and you, then you think about how many of them we eat. It's very limited. Even a hundred years ago, if we were to go to a farmer's market, we would probably see produce that probably doesn't exist anymore. It's just, it's sort of gone out of fashion. So some people like to buy heirloom varieties of seeds to sort of resurrect or preserve old world varieties. And then the third consideration is disease resistance or pest resistance. And a lot of times when you're looking for those qualities, you might be actually looking for a hybrid variety. One is not inherently better than the other. A lot of times plants are hybridized to increase pest resistance or increase disease resistance for common diseases. A really common tomato abbreviation that you'll see on a plant tag is V as in Victor, F as in Frank, N as in Nancy, VFN. And that's for verticillium wilt, fusarium wilt, and nematode resistance. And nematodes are really susceptible, uh, tomatoes are really susceptible to nematodes. They're also really susceptible to fusarium wilt and um, verticillium wilt. So that's a common hybridization that they have created. Some of those hybrids are stable and you can seed save them, they will breed true. But hybrids also occur naturally in the wild. So your choice of heirloom versus hybrid um, is kind of a personal choice. Are you saving seeds? Are you trying to save an old world variety? Are you looking for disease resistance? Um, and sometimes you're not gonna find that information if it's open pollinated or hybrid or um, heirloom on a plant tag. A lot of times if you're shopping seeds on a catalog or in a catalog, it will have that information. But 
Now the uh, hybrid is not the same as a GMO. GMO is a genetically modified organism. Hybridizations occur all the time in the wild. And if you look at corn a thousand years ago, look completely different than the corn we eat today. Um, the same is true of bananas. So we do a lot of hybridization. So um, just something to think about. And a lot of times when I buy plants um, like strawberries, I just go buy what's at the nursery and I don't have a lot of choice. So at least even if you don't have a lot of choice about what you buy, at least you can have a little bit more information um, from these things to think about what you're getting. For um, your peppers, it's pretty much the th same things. Are you looking to seed save? Are you looking for disease resistance? Are you looking to save an old world or unusual variety? Determinant versus indeterminant is something that I see in some peppers, but most often that's not noted. Um, and um, they're kind of like somewhere in between. And we'll talk again about what those definitions are in just a moment. And then uh, another quality when you're looking for peppers might be skin thickness, uh, ripening time, um, flavor, spiciness, other things like that. For both of these, I'm not endorsing uh, Bonnie Plants, but Bonnie Plants has a really good section on um, selection uh, and, and, and qualities of tomatoes and peppers. So just so you know, maybe before you go shopping, you can look on that website and that'll be on the resource sheet. So jumping back to determinant versus indeterminate. Determinant is maybe just kind of how the name sounds. It's a determined size that the plant will grow to. They're often called bush varieties. They usually need less staking. And if you think about it, it's sort of like a person versus a fish. A person, no matter how many salads and protein shakes you drink and eat, you're not gonna get larger than a certain size. Your genes have predetermined how big you're gonna get. Humans are determinate. So we will only grow to a certain size. Indeterminate, on the other hand, it's like a fish, and as long as it keeps living and as long as it keeps eating, it will keep growing. So the determinant varieties are why they're often called a bush variety. They have a predetermined size, which is often the case with bell peppers or sweet uh, hot peppers. They usually lead, need less staking or trellising. They generally produce one crop and it's done, and that's where in bell peppers or chili peppers it gets a little bit um, less of a uh, a little bit more of a gray area because like a lot of the smaller chili peppers will produce year after year. They're a perennial, they'll keep coming back um, and they'll just kind of keep growing. They're like a determined size, but like they're not gonna vine out, but they kind of keep growing as long as they can. They usually don't need he heavy pruning. So if you were in an area where you had a small garden space, then you might wanna be looking for determinant um, tomatoes. And I, I am trying to uh, grow tomatoes, uh, cherry tomatoes up a cattle panel. So that's why I wanted to specifically look for indeterminate. Those are often called vining varieties and they usually need to be staked or trellised. Um, and they'll keep producing until frost or cold kills them off. And I have some photos toward the end that have some neat trellising that people have done in areas that are more tropical and they don't die back in the winter time. And they usually will benefit from pruning off of the suckers. What happened here? Oh yeah. Okay, so that's tomatoes and peppers, plant selection. Basically, you're looking for things like flavor. Ripening time is a big one. Disease resistance. Are you seed saving? Are you trying to save an old world variety? Those are the kind of things when you're thinking about um, tomatoes and peppers. And so when it comes to tomatoes and peppers, um, you know, you may be like if you're in the eastern desert, for example, and you're, you're hotter and windier, you may be really trying to narrow in on something that is heat resistant, that may be wind resistant or wind tolerant. Um, but for the most part, if the conditions are right um, in terms of hot but not too hot, uh, warm soil, adequate water, adequate other things, then um, you're really looking at type of fruit, how much it produces. One of the things like with determinate tomatoes is that you'll get kind of a tomato crop and you'll be done with it. It won't keep producing tomatoes throughout the season. So some people who really love tomatoes, like I'll usually try to do an indeterminate cherry so that as long as it's hot, 
I'll still be getting cherry tomatoes. And then a lot of the heirloom varieties are determinate. and means they'll make one crop and they'll kind of be done. Maybe that crop will occur over a two month period. But so that's one thing I wanted to mention too. So if you have your tomatoes and, um, you know, at some point they just kind of peter out and they're just not really producing and they just seem kind of done, even though the weather is still good and you're still taking care of them, it's probably a determinant variety. You can always reach out to our Master Gardener helpline. Some of the heirlooms are, they're a pretty short window of time. They'll produce for like 30 or 60 days. It's not very long. Um, some of the other determinant varieties will produce for a little bit longer. There's quite a bit of a range in there. But just keep that in mind if you are buying a determinant variety, if there is information on the seed packet or the plant tag um, or the catalog, whatever description, then note that, that if it is a determinant variety and it's producing for 30 days, then after 30 days, it starts to die back. No, it's not you, it's the plant. And with peppers, um, it seems to be a little bit more of a gray area. So that's your plant selection for tomatoes and peppers. And I hope so far that talking about both of them and kind of comparing and contrasting is helpful and not confusing. You know, I wasn't quite sure which direction to go with this, but I hope this is uh, helpful to compare and contrast them. So your site selection and planting techniques will be similar for both, but there are a few differences. For site selection, make sure they get four to six hours of full sun per day. Um, they both like the warm weather, but they don't like it when it gets too hot. And I think it's been a while since I've seen this in writing, um, but if memory serves me correctly, most tomatoes stop producing. They sort of like once it hits 90, they just sort of hang out. So in a day where the top temperature is 95, maybe they'll be growing that tomato until one o'clock and then until four o'clock, they'll just kind of hang out because it's over 90 degrees. And they just kind of hang out and wait for it to cool down and then they'll go back to growing the tomato. On a day when it's 105 degrees and it's 85 by 8 a.m., they may not actually doing a, be doing a lot of growing during that time of day when it's so hot. So if you're in an area that's really exposed, I'm kind of thinking that we're gonna have a hot summer this summer, you know, who knows? But if we have a very hot summer, then you may wanna be mindful of planting where the four to six hours of sun is in the earlier part of the day. The hottest part of the day is usually around three o'clock. So if you do have something where they can be slightly shaded during that hottest part of the day, that is not required. Um, a lot of them will do just fine in full sun throughout the whole day. But that's something that either you can provide artificially through like some shade cloth on 115 degree days or if you have trees or something set up um, where they could be shaded slightly in the afternoon. But they need a minimum of four to six hours per day. So like they'll grow in a house. The plants will grow. We actually have a master gardener who grows great indoor tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, tiny tims, I guess they are. And um, he has very little pest pressure because he's indoors, but he has must have just the right amount of sun coming through his window. So they need four to six hours a day for both tomatoes and peppers. Um, you want to rotate your plantings for both tomatoes and peppers if you've had some disease issues, especially if they're like uh, fungus or mold or soil-borne pathogens. Um, you want to rotate your plantings um, and, and put something in a different family in that area and not keep planting in the same soil. If you're planting in pots and you've had problems, then you may want, oh, sorry. Then you may want to solarize your soil, meaning that you let it sit. So maybe if you have pots and you can put that soil out and not use it till next year, or use that soil on a plant that's less disease um, susceptible, then you could do that. Um, but rotating with peppers and tomatoes is usually helpful when you're having a lot of pest pressure. You wanna avoid planting in, deep, in areas with deep rooted weeds. Uh, that's pretty much true of all your vegetables just because pulling those weeds can damage the pepper and tomato roots. And all of them, um, tomatoes and peppers, do best in uh, well-draining soil. Some of them can sort of tolerate a little bit more clay-like soil, but they do best in well-draining soil. So if you do have um, heavy soil, you can add compost. Oh, that's on the other side. So that's for your site selection. Um, I guess I got these backwards, they're so similar. But so for your tomatoes, the same thing, four to six hours of sun for site selection. 
If you can avoid that intense afternoon sun, that's helpful, but not required. Um, you wanna rotate your plants if you have disease pressure. And then going back to planting, I'm trying to stay, I got these backwards. I'm trying to stay in the tomato first, pepper second order. Even I'm confusing myself. Um, yeah, somebody commented they've seen paste tomatoes grown in dappled shade under the canopy of myrtles in a commercial plaza. That sounds like a great description and a delightful scene. I can just imagine it. And yeah, you know, they need that sun, but they actually don't like that intense heat, which was really contrary to the impression that I had about tomatoes and peppers. So for planting, you can have pretty equal success with seeds or transplants. Um, for tomatoes, the plants can be planted deeper than the soil level. And I have a picture to show that in a moment. For peppers, they can't really be. You wanna pull off the stems and leaves that would be buried when planting for your tomatoes. And as I said, if you have heavy soil or very sandy soil, you could add some compost, but adding a little bit of compost is always a great idea. Maybe two inches on the surface and digging in about four to six inches deep. If you're planting transplants, which are plants that are four to six inches tall, then you wanna add fertilizer when planting. And if you're planting seeds, they're not gonna need that fertilizer till they're several inches tall. And by the time um, you've watered and watered, then that fertilizer will have run through. So you add fertilizer when planting transplants, you hold off when you're planting seeds. They prefer a soil pH of around six to six and a half. Most of your potting soil is about that. Most of our native soil here in Southern California is about seven. There's a cool website. I don't think it's on the resource sheet, but it's E veg, E as in vegetable, no. <laughs> E as an elephant, veg as in vegetable, E veg guide with NRCS. I'll type it in the chat real fast. And on that website, you can um, find out the pH of your um, native soil. This is with Cal Flora, I believe, and uh, NRCS. If anybody wants to look that up, you could drop the link in the chat. It's really cool if you're interested at all in cover cropping. They have information about cover crops that would do really well, but it also tells you the pH of your soil, your native soil. If you have a recent housing development, your soil may be very different. My soil, I think, is around seven. I think in the high desert, it's a little bit higher. Um, and then you can add gypsum or lime if the soil is poor in calcium and you choose, and you can choose a high phosphorus fertilizer as well. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Seeds can be started indoors or in greenhouses. Um, I just started some seeds a couple weeks ago. Is it late? Yes. Is it too late? Nah, it's not too late. If you haven't started them now, go for it. People, some people start them in January on the gamble that we'll have a short early spring or a mild spring. And a lot of times they're harvesting their tomatoes mid to late May. Um, if you're trying to play it safe, because sometimes if we have a cool spring, and you plant those seeds, then they get really leggy, which means they get very long and kind of flop over before it gets warm enough to plant outside. Um, I usually try to plant late February to mid-March. Um, here we are in May. I think I planted them the last week of April, uh, better late than never. Um, probably that said, starting seeds much later than the next week or so, um, they are going to struggle if we have an early hot summer. They'll need to have a little bit extra babying. On the other hand, if we have a long summer, especially with determinant varieties, then you'll be harvesting through August and September. So not too late. Let's see, I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to remember my order here. Going backward to your peppers, it's all the same. Seeds or transplants with equal success. Some of them, um, seeds uh, for Peppers can be better in areas with longer summers. Um, they seem to establish better. You can add organic mixtures uh, like compost to help add organic matter to the soil. You can add fertilizer when planting transplants. They prefer about the same pH. And you can also add gypsum or lime to the soil if you've had problems with blossom end rot or they're low in calcium. Um, and they cannot be planted generally deeper or should not be planted deeper than their soil level. So for a uh, general, thank you for dropping that um, Cal Flora NRCS link in the chat, thank you. 
So for your general planting techniques, like I said already, March to late April is kind of, I should say like late February to late March. It's kind of like your optimal window. Um, transplants uh, can be planted deeper for your tomatoes. If your tomato plant has gotten leggy, this is for tomatoes. Um, plants can be large. Those roots can grow down 48 inches. So if you are gonna plant them in a pot, you still can have success in a pot. Usually they recommend at least 15 inches wide and deep. Um, and if they're in the ground, they should probably be about two feet apart. I had a lot of problems with my tomatoes last year and I with uh, spider mites. And I heard other people had spider mite problems last year. Sometimes the weather is just right. But I also think that um, another factor in my spider mite problem was I planted my tomatoes too close together. They were in pots but I had the pots shoulder to shoulder and I think there was just not enough space. And so the, the spider mite populations really easily spread through and really took down all of my tomatoes. Um, if you're gonna use cages, place them early because sometimes you break those branches as you're trying to place a cage later. Um, young plants may need shade or filtered light while establishing, you know, sometimes even when we have young plants that we plant in March, which should be like the ideal time for transplants. Um, and then someone put in the chat a comment about when they put them in the ground. And that was, I didn't read it all, but I read most of it, it looked like a good comment there. Um, but so like seed starting would happen February to like early April and transplant are plants that are about four to six inches tall you'd start putting those in usually anywhere from March all the way into May. I know in the high desert, they wait until after Mother's Day because they can still have some freezes. Um, but sometimes even if you plant those transplants in March, we can have, which we had this year, you can have hot weather and they may need some protection. I am not a big fan of buying things for my garden if I don't need it, except for plants. And I'm pretty sure I don't need all the plants that I buy, but I buy them anyway. But Shade cloth is one thing I've decided that's probably worth just having on hand. It's probably, you can get a roll of 50 feet, it's not cheap, or a roll of 25 feet, it's not cheap, even a roll of burlap. But on those days when the heat comes on, if you have young plants, it's a good investment to have some just on hand. Um, yeah, and someone else put in the chat um, a comment to agree with that. And so, and if the soil has too much clay or sand, you can uh, amend it with compost to improve the drainer, drainer, <laughs> drainage and water retention. So you're improving drainage and heavy clay soil when you add compost and you're improving water retention in sandy soil. And that uh, organic matter also helps to retain nutrients and um, other things and facilitates fungal networks, which are crucial to getting nutrients to the plant. So Adding compost or um, organic matter is always a great idea when you're planting. Um, we already talked about the seed starting where you can start them in late winter. Some people start them in January. Um, and uh, so if you start them, it's always a gamble. If you start them too early, they may get leggy, which means they sort of flop over. And if you start the seeds too late, um, they may need some extra heat protection. So here's your tomato. Um, and, uh, you know, if they get too long, uh, some people just do this anyways. This is like a practice, I think they call it trenching, where you lay it sideways. And so what tomatoes can do is every place where there is a leaf, that is called a node. And at the node um, right here, then they can send new roots out. So this would have been a leaf here, and this would have been a leaf here. And then when it was planted, that place where the leaf met the plant is going to send out roots. So what a lot of people do is they either bury it deep. These are for tomatoes again. You bury it deep and you strip off the lower leaves. You strip off the lower leaves because these leaves aren't going to be able to photosynthesize. And as they're decaying, they can bring like disease into the plant. You don't have to. I usually just throw the leaves in the soil but I do remove them from the plant so they're not bringing disease into the plant. And then it also probably maybe stimulates um, this a little bit. You can actually see the node in this drawing down here on the lower right-hand side. 
And so this is trenching where you lay it on its side and bury it, again, removing the leaves and it will send roots out. Some people, like I said, just do this as standard practice to get a more robust root system. Some people do it because their tomatoes get too long and they're kind of floppy. So this is a great thing about tomatoes. Here on this one, they would just bury it too deep and pull those leaves off. When you're looking at planting techniques for peppers, same size pot, minimum of 15 inches. The root systems are not quite as big. Um, if you are gonna use cages, cause sometimes you need a cage to prevent the pods, the like the, for the sweet peppers to prevent the pods from breaking the branches. So you wanna cage those early. They may need protection from heat. Um, transplants are recommended in areas with short growing seasons. Your growing season may be short because of wind and real hot summers, or it may be a short growing season like up in the mountains. Um, but transplants should not be planted deeper than they are. I've seen peppers send roots out from the nodes and sometimes along the stem, but in general, this is not a practice for peppers. So that, that is a tomato only practice. So when you're talking about planting techniques, then um, peppers, you bury them at the same level that their soil is at. And for tomatoes, you can plant them a little bit deeper. Let me see if there was any, um, not too late now. Uh, Make sure you protect them from heat. If you know it's like it was 50 on Monday and it's gonna be like 98 tomorrow or Saturday or something, they may need a little protection. Mm -hmm. So for watering, this is gonna be true for both tomatoes and peppers. Consistent watering is the key to well-developed fruit. So if you think about tomatoes, when they set their size, if you kind of forget to water them and then you water them, they physically burst. They bring on all that water into the fruit and they'll burst. And that's the same thing that happens to navel oranges if we've got a lot of rain in the spring or you over water. And consistent watering also helps reduce bitterness. Um, so consistent watering is key. And I think it's why a lot of gardeners um, who are first time or beginner gardeners are really successful is because they probably pay a little more attention. So it's not really about being a great gardener, it's being about a, an attentive gardener. And vegetables are like 85 to 95% water, and they'll suffer really early from inconsistent watering. They'll drop flowers. Consistent watering is the key. And you want the water, you want the soil to be like a wrung out sponge. You don't want it to be soggy, you don't want it to be dry. There are some practices, there are two practices to keep in mind. One practice is that when you water, you um, let them dry ever so slightly between waterings because it reduces things like nematode populations and pathogens. And that's definitely true, but you've got to be good at that balance between letting it dry out slightly, but not too much. So when in doubt, you want to keep it like a wrung out sponge. The other thing that some people do, I don't know about it so much for peppers. Yeah, I've heard that for peppers too. Um, there are some people who will kind of hold back water right before harvesting like a fruit or a vegetable. I mean, I guess they're all fruits, you know, anything that like a, uh, a tomato, an orange, a peach, a strawberry. Um, and in doing so, then your fruit can be a little bit more flavorful. I'm just mentioning this in case you've heard of it. Um, and what I want to say about it is that you've got to be really good at withholding just the right amount of water so that you don't damage the fruit and you lose the fruit or the fruit loses quality or loses texture quality, flavor quality. So um, if you've heard of it, it is something that people do where they let them dry slightly between waterings to reduce pests or they reduce watering, say, by 10 or 15 percent to increase flavor. But you just have to be really good at that. I'm not that attentive. When I let it dry slightly, it's because I forgot. And so in general, the soil should be like a wrung out sponge. Um, you want to water deeply. Peppers and tomatoes both have deep roots. For both peppers and tomatoes, you want to avoid getting water on the foliage. Drip irrigation is a great idea. And that's true for all of your fruits and vegetables and most of your plants in general. A lot of the native plants have a pretty waxy cuticle and I think they're less likely to be getting, you know, wilts and molds and uh, fungus, but keeping the water off the foliage is important. 
Um, you can do drip irrigation, burrows and troughs. Uh, also proper watering helps your fruit and plant, um, helps it stand up to sunburn, helps it stand up to wind physically, like literally, because if it gets a little bit dried out and it's windy, it's more likely to snap or bend. And then it also helps protect the plants from thrip and mite damage. And so proper watering is really important. If you have your plants in a pot, you wanna think about what type of pots you have. Terracotta pots are gonna be very different than black plastic. So if you have 10 tomato and pepper plants on your porch and some are in terracotta pots and some are in black plastic and some are in brown plastic, they're gonna have different water needs because that material is gonna absorb or not absorb water. It's gonna absorb heat at different rates. So just keep all that in mind. Oyas are a ceramic um, like um, vase or jar that you can add water to and you bury it and the water releases slowly. I've seen that done with tomatoes and peppers. The tomatoes and peppers need a lot of water. So it may be a case where you're looking for a variety that is like a low water needs or you're giving them supplemental watering um, and just kind of watching. Um, and maybe you have an heirloom variety that does well with low water um, and that would be good, but you just need to be, tomatoes and peppers are pretty high water use plants. So here's an example of drip irrigation. Here's a picture of a tomato and they are filling this up and they have a little tip, like a little cone that goes into the ground. This is kind of cool because it delivers the water into the soil. Um, you just want to make sure that plant is getting enough water. Mulch is a great way to keep weeds down and moisture in. It um, help keeps uh, like snails and slugs away from your plants. If you are gonna mulch, um, you could use uh, straw, bark, um, pine needles. Sometimes people use synthetic materials. I kind of recommend using organic materials. If you are gonna be mulching, then um, you wanna mulch like this pepper is a good example. It's like kind of right up to the stem, but it's not like piled all around the stem. And just be mindful of your uh, fertilizing. If you have a granular fertilizer that you're putting on top of the mulch, it's not gonna get in. So you would either use a liquid fertilizer or you would pull that mulch away from your plants to fertilize. So um, again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm just going right along. Our master food preserver coordinator is gonna jump on in just a few minutes, but I'm just wrapping up here. So with fertilizer, it says a fertilized soil when planting, I should add to that, uh, that's the transplants. You don't need to fertilizer when planting seeds. Um, they don't need it and it's gonna wash away before they can even use it. And then you're gonna fertilize about every um, three to four weeks if they're in a pot and every four to six weeks or so if they're in the ground. I usually fertilize every six weeks. If you use a conventional or organic fertilizer, the choice is yours. Just know that uh, conventional fertilizers have higher nutrient levels usually. And that compost is so great, really wonderful for soil, but it's not a replacement for fertilizer. It usually has low nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium levels. So it's really great part of your um, gardening regimen, but it's not going to be a replacement for fertilizer. So when you have your plants in pots, um, then that second bullet point where you fertilize like every three to four weeks. And so you're doing half as much in a pot, but because you're doing half as much, they still need the same amount of food, but you don't wanna burn them. And so you do it twice as often. So in the ground, you wanna fertilize about every four, three to four weeks. And I apologize, because it's not really clear here, but in the ground, so in the pot, let's get this right here. <laughs> In the pot, you're gonna fertilize about every three to four weeks, approximately every month. And in the ground, you're gonna fertilize probably like every four to six weeks. Again, it kind of depends on how much nutrients you wanna add, how rich your soil is, how um, you know many tomato, like how many plants you have growing in a small area that might be utilizing that nutrient. And if you have a question about fertilizing, that's a great thing to reach out to our helpline. Everybody has slightly different conditions whether they're growing in the ground or pots or what kind of tomatoes they have, all these different factors. And we can help you determine how much you need to fertilize. Usually we recommend that you fertilize about every six weeks in the pot. It would be a little bit more often. Um, and then just look for signs of nutrient deficiency. One of the things that comes up a lot with um, 
Uh, tomatoes and peppers also that can get blossom end rot is the use of eggshells to provide calcium to the soil. Eggshells are not a bad thing to add. Some people put them in a um, you know, coffee grinder and they make them really small and they add them. And they definitely add to the total mix in the soil. And in the future, they probably add some calcium. But in the short run, that calcium is all tied up in the eggshell and it's not really readily available to the plant. So, and one of the problems with blossom end rot, which can be frustrating, and I have some pictures of that, is that usually by the time you see the symptoms on the plant, it really should have been fertilized like four to six weeks prior to that. So if you've had a problem with that in the past, then you want to be amending your soil at the time of planting um, with what is it, gypsum or lime? That's in that earlier slide there. Um, so uh, calcium, calcium end rot is not something that you see on the plant and then you fertilize incorrect. If it's a nutrient deficiency of like nitrogen where the leaves are yellowing, that's something you can see on the plant and then correct. And here for the tomatoes are some common nutrient deficiencies and what they look like. There is a really great, I must have it in the resources, but I don't want to forget. There's this woman, she used to be the Master Gardener Program Coordinator for LA County, Yvonne Savio. And she has a website, Gardening in LA or Gardening LA. I'm so sure it's in my resources. And one blog that she did was about tomato troubleshooting. And it was just really informative about, is your tomato doing this? Then this is what it is. She has a lot of experience gardening in Southern California. So if you've been having problems, you know, you can reach out to our Master Gardener helpline, but that's another um, cool resource for you to have. And peppers can also have some problems related to nutrient deficiency that we'll talk about in just a minute. So for pest management, you got your vertebrates, your invertebrates, your pathogens, and your diseases. For vertebrates, talking about the whole team comes out. You've got your gophers, your voles, your squirrels, your mice, your rats, deer potentially, chickens, I don't know whatever, they all love those tomatoes as much as we do. And, and really for vertebrate pests, it's going to be mechanical barriers and doing some population control. So here on this picture, here on the, well, the only picture, then this is hardware cloth laid down to keep gophers out. Um, and uh, if like, I just, I've been waiting for my darn cherry tomatoes and the one that was almost ripe is uh, getting eaten by something. I'm so mad. So now, and, and, and so now you've got to respond with like physical barriers. So I'm going to put up some probably hardware cloth above the ground because I don't know if it's a mouse or what it is. Um, but with most of the vertebrate pests, it's going to be physical barriers and population control. Unfortunately, it's not like a magic solution. Um, it's physical barriers and population control. Um, something like this, you know, this is a repeat from another presentation, but I really like this photo here and just a little reminder that vegetables need about six hours of sunlight every day. But I love this raised bed where it has these um, protection from pests, but it can be lifted open. And uh, just remember for both tomatoes and peppers, they usually need pollination. To, I say usually because tomatoes are technically self-fruitful um, and they should be able to self-pollinate with a little bit of wind. But peppers can really suffer from quality of the fruit if they're under uh, pollinated. So make sure that if you do have protection from pests with these mechanical barriers, it's still allowing pollination to happen, or especially with peppers, you might not get good fruit. Here's some other ways you can provide protection. Um, this is um, plastic, which could be used, for example, to start your seedlings you know, a little bit earlier in the season. And then you take the plastic off when it gets warm. Having this cattle panel as a structure here on top allows you to put shade cloth on. You can also put shade cloth on and put it on just on like say the, um, you know, the side that is getting this, uh, you know, sun from at 2 p.m. or something. And so you can just have it on here and you can have it temporary. So I really like these kind of structures. Sometimes with tomatoes, um, this can get a little out of control with the tomatoes getting a little bit tall, and that's maybe where you would want a determinant variety that you could provide more pest protection to, that you could provide more uh, protection from the heat um, to. Um, and your peppers, 
this might be a little bit short for peppers. This would probably be a better size for both your tomatoes and peppers, but just some ideas. Here's a very tall one. Here's peppers and tomatoes. This is up in the Crafton Hills area and they have a lot of problems with squirrels. So they have them growing quite tall, but it still can lift up. And uh, this is PVC and chicken wire and their problem is mostly larger squirrels. So that chicken wire is small enough even though smaller rodents can get in there. Um, here's another idea where you lift up the um, uh, bottom here and, uh, or you lift the top, I guess, for tomatoes and peppers, this would be a little bit small, but just another idea. So these are some cool tre trellising of tomatoes um, and the way that they are set up. You know, this is like some kind of Mediterranean climate. And so this is not happening in one season. Look at the thickness of these tomato vines. Pretty remarkable. And so they are, um, you know, probably multiple seasons growing. You can also grow tomatoes upside down. And uh, he'll be back in like two minutes, five minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's our master food preserver coordinator. She's coming back to present in just a minute. Um, tomatoes, you can hang upside down. Um, you just want to keep in mind the weight of the soil on whatever you're hanging it from, okay? But basically they just drill a small hole, they gently push a young plant through, and then they fill the rest with soil, they water from overhead. It deals with like, if you have gopher issues or any problems like that. Um, and so uh, this is one way to grow tomatoes. Peppers, they're not really into that. They don't really think that's a great idea. Um, I have never seen peppers grow in that way. Is it possible, perhaps? They just don't seem to be into that kind of thing. Tomatoes are much less uh, picky when it comes to how that all goes down. So if you have grown peppers hanging upside down, feel free <clears throat> to put something in the chat, but that is not a universal thing for both tomatoes and peppers. So this is the UC Integrated Pest Management site for tomatoes. When you click on it, if you like to do your own research, then it gives a whole list of pests and how to manage them, great photos, there's one for peppers as well. It's also breaking down the cultural tips, which is kind of the bullet points that I covered today in case you've forgotten anything I shared. Um, but if you don't like to do your own research or, <coughs> excuse me, or if you need a little help with that research, then reach out to our Master Gardener helpline. Some common pests are mites, hornworms, aphids, nematodes, cutworms. Here's what nematodes look like on the lower right. Um, and just remember that all insecticidal sprays, whether they're organic or conventional, if they're effective, they kill everything they come in contact with. And that all of those caterpillars are larvae of butterflies and moths. So some things we can tolerate like the bird poop caterpillar or swallowtail butterfly larvae eats like five citrus leaves and it's done. And then you have like the tomato hornworm, um, which I don't have a picture, but I have a picture somewhere down the road. Um, and they cause a lot of damage. I've started uh, relocating them to some potatoes I grow as they grow into the sphinx moth. But just remember every spray and every caterpillar, we love our pollinators. We're not such big fans of their babies. And so we just got to keep in mind, what can our plants tolerate? What can they not tolerate? Um, here are some pictures of aphids. Here's our hornworm. I think they're beautiful, but they sure are destructive. Common diseases, here's what verticillium wilt, fusarium wilt, and powdery mildew look like in that order. Very similar. This is a great example. You could send us a picture and we could try to help you diagnose. If you have a lot of this, you might want to rotate your crops into different soil. You might want to make sure that you're not getting any overhead water on your plants or that they're not in an overly shaded area. Or you might want to try a variety that's a little bit resistant or has disease resistance to these wilts and mildews. Environmental disorders are related to cultural practices. Here, this splitting is often caused by inconsistent watering. This uh, uh, here on the upper right is blossom end rot, and that's usually due to a lack of calcium. There's one other thing that it can be caused by. Ah, totally forgot. Um, but uh, blossom end rot is um, something that you do need to proactively deal with. And then this is uh, caused by improper pollination. This one is called cap facing. And um, 
Here's some common pepper diseases, verticillium, wilt, mosaic virus, powdery mildews, environmental diseases for peppers are gonna be um, you know, the same. This pepper up here, this is sunburn, um, just too much heat. Here's some common pests. This is what the integrated pest management site uh, really has great photos, how to identify them. And then um, we can help you walk through how to manage them with least toxic methods. Here's some other things as well. Um, some nematodes, disease and symptoms. This is that, oh, I think this is the cat facing the improper. This is for peppers. A lot of times when you see this, um, oh, this is peppers, it's not called cat facing. Is it called cat? I don't think so. Um, and this one is caused by incomplete or poor pollination. Maybe have a good color, um, but misshapen with few seeds. And it can also be caused by low temperature or not enough light. You wanna make sure the plants are in full sun and get enough pollination. So for harvesting, this is for tomatoes. Yep, okay, so for tomatoes, um, you don't wanna leave it on the vine any longer than necessary. Once they start to color in, and I've tried this a couple times, and once they start to color in, all of the um, chemistry that's needed in the tomato to have a good tasting fruit is there, and it's just the sugars are transitioning. So you don't wanna leave it on the vine any longer than necessary, and even if the whole point is to get great homegrown tomatoes, then you can do that by picking them a little bit early, especially if you have a lot of pest pressure, because they will taste just as good if they're indoors. You're still getting them picked fairly fresh off the vine. They're still not going through a period of cold storage. They're still not having any other um, treatments or exposures along the way, which might impact the flavor. They're not being waxed, um, any of those things. So. Um, you can harvest them when they start to color in and they should taste just as good. Um, and so here you go. Um, you can pick them when they're slightly unripe and let them ripen indoors. That can also help prevent cracking as well. Um, if you are going to seed save, you should let them fully mature on the plant. And the nice thing about if, if you, so I'm actually going to try this now that I'm thinking about it. For my tomato that was almost ripe and the pest got it, I might actually try to harvest the seeds from that tomato. Um, and generally pruning is not necessary, but there are some people that swear by pruning tomatoes and it's sort of people seem to fall into one or two camps. Some people prune all their tomatoes. Some people don't prune any of their tomatoes. Some people pinch them back to promote growth. Some people pinch the growing tip back to get them to branch out. Um, and, you know, I think I don't want to say it comes down to personal preference, but there seems to be science kind of on both sides of it being necessary or not necessary. Like it's kind of like there's a lot of information out there and I've seen good arguments on both sides. So however you choose um, to do it, um, there is information on the UC Integrated Pest Management site about pruning. And you can just kind of make your own best judgment. The guy from Dave Wilson's nursery, Tom Spellman, does a lot of great education on fruit trees. And I like what he says, which is that I'm just doing and sharing what's worked well for me. Um, it doesn't mean that it's the only answer. So if you prune or don't prune, you guys don't need to come to blows at the family dinner table, um, but just share your arguments why you do or don't. If you want to put arguments for why you do or don't prune your tomatoes in the chat, feel free to do so. For harvesting your peppers, um, you can stake larger pepper plants to help support the pods. This is really important. Allow them to fully ripen and allow hot peppers to fully ripen so heat can develop. A lot of times people have poor tasting peppers because they were not fully ripe. So it's important to know what color they are when they ripe and what size they're supposed to be. Like a lot of limes that we traditionally pick when they're green, I know this is not tomatoes or peppers, but they're actually ripe when they're yellow. So we prefer them in the culinary way when they're slightly unripe. Peppers are not gonna taste good when they're unripe. So it's important to know, is it supposed to be green or is it actually gonna turn red or yellow? Um, and you wanna make sure um, that it is the right size as well. If you're gonna seed save, you can leave it on a little bit longer. Um, you don't wanna leave them on too long if you're eating them because especially the bell peppers can get kind of shrivelly, wrinkly, something dried out a little bit. Pruning is not necessary. Sometimes people prune like pinch back the growing tips to increase bushiness. Um, but if you have bitter peppers, make sure they're fully ripe 
And watering consistency is really important. That's the same thing with cucumber. So a lot of cucumber bitterness comes from inconsistent watering. And that is probably one of the things that makes peppers the most difficult to get good bell peppers at home. I think that those bell peppers need a good organic rich soil and they need consistent watering and the right amount of sun. And so if you are interested, hot peppers seem to be a lot easier to grow. Bell peppers are a little bit more challenging. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but just be mindful of all the things that I've talked about today. Seed saving from tomatoes and peppers is um, pretty easy. Peppers can cross pollinate with other peppers, sweet and hot. So we'll do a presentation on seed saving from tomatoes and peppers probably in July when the time starts to be saving from them. And tomato, see, tomato, tomato seeds need to be fermented um, to be stored properly. And we've got some blogs on that. I've got a basics of seed saving presentation and we'll do seed saving on tomatoes and peppers um, in July. So, <laughs> to sum all that up, while there are some differences, if you can grow a great tomato, you can grow a great pepper. The differences to note are that uh, do not plant peppers deeper than the soil line like you can with tomatoes. Peppers are a little bit more cold tolerant, so they can be started a little earlier, although they can freeze too. So they're not like tough, but they're a little bit, they can be started a little bit earlier than tomatoes. And peppers are more susceptible to burn than tomatoes are. Um, a few more differences are incomplete or poor pollination. Um, and maybe this is a similarity, but uh, more so in peppers, it leads to misshapen peppers. A lack or, of water or inconsistent water can lead to bitterness in peppers and kind of mealiness in tomatoes. Peppers should be harvested when they're fully ripe. Um, picking before maturity can be another cause of bitter flavor. Tomatoes, on the other hand, can be picked a little bit earlier as they've started to color in. And if you are seed saving, tomatoes are easier to seed save than peppers because they usually don't crossbreed as much because they're self-pollinating. So these are the resources that I'm going to be putting on the resource sheet and I'll be posting on our website. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website, follow us on social media. We'll be putting up our um, June classes pretty soon. So check our website where you registered today and reach out to our Master Gardener helpline. Don't be shy, we love to answer questions. There's about 215 volunteers in our program and we have a dedicated group of about 10 Master Gardeners who faithfully answer phone calls and emails. And we love to have questions. It challenges us and we'll share with you our research and we'll help you troubleshoot exactly what's going on in your yard. So reach out to our Master Gardener helpline for any of your questions. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, we'll see.